Well, to be honest, I wasn't expecting to make this video originally, but not only was this the most requested topic I've ever covered on the channel, I also think it's an incredibly interesting period in history for the Sonic franchise and Sega as a whole, due to Sonic Heroes being the first new mainline game to be released with Sega being only a developer slash publisher, not a console maker anymore. And to pile on top of that, Sonic Team having to follow up with one of, if not the best Sonic games ever made, <coughs> and one of the greatest platformers ever. <coughs> Uh, sorry, I had a bit of a cold there. Anyways, to say the odds were stacked against them, well, that'd be an understatement. With that being said, let's discover the true power of teamwork and check out the development and concept art of Sonic Heroes. Before jumping headfirst into the art, per usual, I think it's beneficial we lay the groundwork for the rather interesting development of Heroes, because context is always wonderful. So. After the mass portings of SA1, SA2, and Mega Collection to the GameCube, once the Dreamcast fell into the abyss, <laughs> producer Yuji Naka, director Takashi Azuka, and 19-membered Sonic Team USA, which was formed after SA2 and still located in San Francisco, the team knew they had mountains of pressure upon them to work on the new adventure title. While still keeping the formula similar, they opted to appeal to a much larger user base of new and old fans and not make a direct sequel to Sonic Adventure 2. As Azuka put it in an interview with Nintendo Power back in November of 2003, he wanted to create a brand new sub-series for Sonic, rather than just recreating an adventure sequel, that featured a storyline where all three characters had to combine forces to overcome a greater challenge. Thus, the iconic team gameplay was born, which has defined Sonic Heroes from the rest of the franchise to this day. After the large outcry leading up to SA2's release with the question of Tails not being included as a playable character, Sonic Team decided with Heroes that they would make the largest playable roster the franchise had seen at the time with 12 playable characters, and actually funny enough, more were even planned before balancing was taken into consideration. As Azuka said in another interview with EGM in 2004, Sonic Team revived the Chaotix as the fourth team, while also introducing and bringing back characters from previous games, like Big, Cream, Gam- oh, I mean Omega, along with Metal Sonic who was redesigned by lead art director for both adventure games and heroes, Kazuyuki Hoshino, who also originally designed Metal Sonic and Amy all the way back at Sonic CD, which was also his last story-related appearance. Anyways, 2003 was the set release date, and also dubbed the Year of Sonic, broadening the brand with the absolutely Kino anime Sonic X, and the first McDonald's Happy Meal tie-in in a decade, which came with these little toys that I actually remember owning a ton, along with Shadow Basketball. The team faced some serious development issues as they decided to change the engine to make the transition to multi-platform easier, now going with the Criterion software-made RenderWare game engine which did the exact opposite due to Sonic Team having to make pretty much all of their work again from scratch, along with also getting the game to run on the Xbox, GameCube, PC, and the much weaker PS2. Since there was 19 people a part of Sonic Team in total, the development crunch got so bad that Azuka, who was also one of the two level designers for the game, recalled in an interview with Game Informer, ignore the eye roll inducing title, that as they got to the later stages of development, the other level designer got so ill, the development fell solely on Azuka, who recalls not sleeping at all and losing 22 pounds. So only Azuka designed a portion of the levels. With the remaining Alive development team, Heroes would release in December 2003 for Japan, and January, February, and even November of 2004 for the other various regions and consoles. Now that the groundwork is laid, let's get talking about that art. Much like SA2 with the Hero story opening, we were blessed with some sick storyboard openings for both Team Dark and the opening cutscene to the game. Let's start with the opening cutscene, which was done by lead art director Kazuyuki Hoshino. So when I say we have a lot of the opening, it's 25 pages worth of intro animation. Since the majority is one-to-one, -one, I will try and briefly show the whole thing while mainly pointing out the big differences so we aren't spending 30 minutes on this section, because trust me, you should have saw the first draft of this. But as we get to page 4 here, I want to point out Sonic doing all these cool tricks and showing off the triangle jump. I wonder if the third board down on the left was an homage to CD's intro a bit. Who knows, maybe I'm looking a tad too far into it, but I really like the dark shading of Sonic in this also. On the next pages, we get a pretty one-to-one -one intro of Tails and Knuckles, with the ground collapsing underneath Sonic, and Tails being there to catch him, even with the little half-transparent Tails behind him, and Knuckles coming in and breaking the giant rock pillars. What I thought was super cool on the next pages here too, was little display on the side of the rocks falling behind them, which is apparently what was causing all the dust, which isn't shown in the final cutscene. As we move on to Team Dark, this is where things get quite different, as it starts with Rouge acting all sneaky-like and checking out the capsules Shadow is held in, 
when Omega then comes in onto the scene to completely decimate the place, which is where Shadow comes in to save her. Check out this super awesome frame at the bottom there, which reminds me a lot of this image of Sonic and Amy from CD. This is completely different from the final scene, where it starts with the Shadow waking up and saving Rouge which we then learn is due to Omega blowing the whole place up. I also want to point out how different Rouge and Omega look in these storyboards, with Rouge having what looks more like a jumpsuit going on, while Omega is looking like a cross between the E-101 series and this guy. The Team Dark introduction ends a lot differently too, with the storyboard just showing Omega pointing a gun at the panel, while in the game, they reconcile which transitions to Team Rose. Want to talk about changes? Their intro is drastically different this time, with it starting out at the beach hut, cutting to Amy who looks like she's drinking her sorrows away at a bar, already looking at the picture of Sonic in the newspaper, where Big and Cream join her, and wait, is Cream also drinking a martini? And then I assume Amy riles them all up to go after Sonic, and they raise their fist up in drunken rage. This is completely different from the final opening, where it opens with Amy reading the newspaper and it flying out of her hand, with Cream trying to grab it, and then Big saves them. It's also odd how Big looks in this storyboard and it reminds me way too much of this picture for some reason. This cuts to the Chaotix, which opens pretty similar, but after that it seems they took a lot more of the story selection cutscenes where Charmy comes in busting through the door. Vector looks incredibly different here compared to his final counterpart, and whatever the hell that thing is. In the final cutscene, it cuts to the radio and then a shot of the team together before moving on. The storyboards reveal the Egg Fleet a lot differently too, shrouding it in the clouds before the big reveal, while the final scene shows off a panning shot around one of the ships that leads to the rest of the fleet. I thought these two pages were cool especially, with the action shots of Team Sonic coming out of a cloud of smoke, grinding and jumping across scraps of metal, much like the final product. Super cool. The next two pages were super awesome too, showing off more action shots before it pans to Metal Sonic. These may be my favorite set out of the intro storyboards, showing off Neo Metal Sonic and making him look super foreboding with the lightning crashing down and giving us these sweet side profiles. My favorite panel is at the bottom here, with the shot facing up towards him, making Metal look really ominous. Along with the zoom in on the eye, which it even says there, zoom in. I love it. The two final storyboards for this were significantly different also. I love how serious Sonic looks in the storyboard, which reminds me again a lot of the CD art here. I think the contrast with the serious Sonic pose and then how cute Tails and Knuckles look is way better than the final product of Sonic looking like he doesn't know what the hell is going on before everyone jumps in. The logo looks incredibly different here, as it's a lot more reminiscent of the Sonic 1 logo too, while the animation of it being built piece by piece is the same as the final product. As for the Team Dark intro, it was done by the great Shiro Mayakawa, who I've covered extensively on this channel in my Shadow and Rouge development video, so go check that out if you're interested in him in depth. But in short, he wrote SA2 through Black Knight, along with self-teaching himself how to draw the storyboards for SA2 onward. So yeah, he's pretty awesome. As for the storyboards themselves, well the final cutscene is an exact one-to-one, -one, as we see here with Rouge flying down and acting all sneaky-like. What I found super interesting was comparing this to Hoshino's design of Rouge's outfit, as they're quite different, although Mayakawa's is a lot closer to her final design, so I assume that Hoshino's storyboards were done a lot earlier in development. These two storyboards are my favorite out of this, with Shadow waking up, no pun intended, and Rouge surprised to see him alive. I love these sketches of Shadow in this, look how cool he looks, with these real heavy dark sketches around his eyes. What is so cool about this is how faithful of a translation the cutscene is to the storyboard, even with the surprised look on Rouge's face. I love this panel of Shadow going after Omega here at the bottom, before Rouge comes in to stop both of them. The facial expressions in the storyboard are so funny to me, especially this last one. The scene changes with the gang settling their differences, and Rouge mediating the beef between Shadow and Omega, who has his final design in this compared to Hoshino's, before hopping down and the gang coming together to become Team Dark. I can't say it enough, but I love how sassy and expressive Rouge is in these storyboards and her facial expressions, along with the faithful translation throughout. Makes for such an iconic intro sequence. And while I'm not going to sit here and analyze it, I do think it's worth mentioning that the Sonic Mega Collection also had a prototype version of the cutscene, and the Heroes opening, which were unlockables in the game. Pretty neat seeing the developer lens on this scene, along with them displaying pieces of the storyboards I just showed off. I'll link the full thing in the description, but shout out to Saystroll for uploading this onto YouTube. Moving forward, pretty much all of the art is directly uncredited, but we can assume it was overseen by Hoshino in some capacity. As for the art itself, we have some really interesting types of art that haven't been featured on the channel before, starting with these two action shots of Sonic. The one on the left shows him tearing a hole right through a tall patch of grass, to showcase an idea of the rocket excel I assume, while the one on the right shows off an idea of what I would guess is a very early prototype of the power character fans and the animation that happens when a non-power character uses them. 
I absolutely adore these other two, as the one on the bottom, which shows off a prototype illustration of Sonic's combo attack. I love the expression Sonic gives off of dodging the bullets being fired at him, sleeping, and then finally punching the robot. It's super cool. While the piece up top is also super cool and expressive, showing off another prototype of Sonic's moveset, giving us this gorgeous homing attack SA2 bounce bracelet mix. Another piece that is also one of my favorites out of this game was this concept art of the Team Sonic trio with Sonic up front and looking quite serious while Tails and Knuckles are in the back. Sonic's pose here reminds me a lot of this hero's wallpaper design too. I do kind of wonder why they made him look pretty serious throughout all the concept art, as Heroes' tone isn't reflective of that at all. One of the most interesting things I found while researching for this video was the different concept art and evolutions of the box art this game went through. Originally, these images were from a website called assemblergames.com, which is now shut down, but hosted a lot of information about obscure emulators and platforms. But luckily, the owners moved to another website called Obscure Gamers News, so check that out if you're interested. Anyways, let's start with these two pieces of concept box art. And while for the one on the left, I found it would have been a very odd cover, as it's a close-up of Sonic's face, which looks cool and all until we zoom in closer and see that Tails and Knuckles are forever trapped in Sonic's eye for the rest of the time. As for the piece on the right, this shows off Team Sonic once again with a giant mountain in the background. Sonic, Knuckles, and Tails standing on a cliff doing that iconic hero's pose they've done for pretty much all these box arts, along with a sketch of the quote-unquote final logo in the background. This final one shows Sonic still doing that pose and Knuckles and Tails on top of separate cliffs to the side, looking all cool. While well, Tails looks like he is uh, about to go kill someone. I think this would have been a sick cover art if it was fully realized, but nothing beats the iconic North American one of the three up in the air, I will say. We have a huge amount of stage concept art for heroes, more than we've ever covered on the channel so far, surprisingly, which a lot of the upcoming and aforementioned art comes from the Red Ring unlockables in Generations, but I should clarify, this is not concept art of Sonic Generations rendition of Seaside Hill. That being said, let's get started with everyone's favorite, Seaside Hill. I had an incredibly weird run-in when comparing the concept art with its in-game translation, as a majority of the art is labeled Seaside Hill across the internet, and hell, even Generations goofed it, since this is actually concept art of Ocean Palace. Granted, this could be they originally wanted all of this in Seaside Hill, but couldn't fit it therefore moving it to the second act. I'm not really sure. Nonetheless, I had to do my own detective work and break out the good old free camera and see where this stuff was translated. And let me tell ya, it wasn't easy. I tried my best to be as accurate as I could. Anyways, let's get started with the only actually confirmed piece of Seaside Hill art, which was shared by the Sonic Twitter in November of 2020, among others I'll point out later. That being, this picture leading up to the finale of Seaside Hill, where you go through and scale the rock-shaped whale, what I found cool about this piece was the giant water spout coming out of the whale along with how the track drops off in this, making the player clear a gap to enter the whale's mouth, which neither is present in the final product, that has the whole track go into the mouth, no water spout, and also has more of a structure atop the whale. But other than that, it's pretty accurate. There's also this piece that showcases a few different pieces of scenery throughout the level. Starting at the bottom here shows off what I assume is the prototype loop-de-loop -loop from the beginning area of Seaside Hill, while the other two sections of this picture show off the general architecture of the level. And well, that's it for Seaside Hill. Now let's move on to Ocean Palace. Beginning with these two super cool pieces, taking a look at the one on the left here, we can see that this showed off a long stretch of the track, with the two big whale statues overlooking it, and while this wasn't translated one to one in the game, we can see about a third of the way into the level, after clearing this tunnel with the egg robos, you are presented with this area here where you have the option of taking two paths to the next door. That on the lower path, the two whales are actually present, and this resembles the concept art picture quite nicely, with the door in the back right, much like the concept art design. As for the other picture that showcases the top section of the castles featured around the level, with its jagged harpoon edge at the top, while these are generally featured around the level, I think this one in the concept art most closely resembles the entrance of one of the sea castles right after you clear the turtle section, as it shares the same triple layer structure as the concept art, which isn't displayed in most of the other in-game castles. Before we get to the final big structures, there's some smaller cool pieces from this level, like this piece of the art showing off all the different tribal designs that are painted across the walls and such throughout both levels. Another cool piece was this concept art design for the whale statues that are featured around Ocean Palace, as the concept art was translated pretty much one to one here. Another piece I found super cool was this picture that illustrates the design of the walls throughout the level, and focusing on the left here, we actually have a prototype of one of those giant rolling balls of death, which in this has two major blades going off of them, while in the final product, the boulder has spikes on the side. Kinda cool. Now what I found super interesting was the amount of art just dedicated to the final palace section here by the gold ring. Starting with this piece here that seems like it was the earliest build of this area, having the whale tails on the sides in this piece, along with the fish looking heads while in the final product, the large stone whale heads are used instead of the fish heads. 
As for these two pieces here, which seem to be later renditions of the same palace, as they both share the same whale tail at the tip of the palace. The top design seems to be more of an outline of what Sonic Team wanted the structure to look like overall, while the bottom one here is a pretty close rendition, although there is quite a few things changed here, as the whole courtyard grassy area was completely scrapped. And finally, we get to this absolutely gorgeous design of what was another early prototype of the final section. But what's even cooler about this piece is there's even a colored version of it. This thing is gorgeous! These pieces were shown off at E3, and while it doesn't say exactly what year, I would assume E3 2002 or 2003, as Heroes had a 20 month development cycle. I don't have much to say in regards to this piece, except that it's drop dead gorgeous, and I love the cliffside waterfalls in the back with the giant whale tails. It was such a cool touch in my opinion. Unfortunately, my favorite level in the game, Grand Metropolis, had no release concept art from Sega, but Casino Park did. While not being directly translated in the final game, this piece shows off one of the many areas where Sonic and his friends are running across various gambling boards, with all the different bright lights flashing and vibrant colors coming at them. Dare I say, the final game also translated this even a tad better. I found it super interesting, as in this piece, Sonic is running like normal, where in the final game, whenever you're placed on a pinball or game board, you're always in a ball. It's a beautiful concept art picture. Rail Canyon and Bullet Station both got their own pieces respectively. Let's focus on the Rail Canyon piece first, as not only is this a super cool piece, but the two main things I want to point out is just how different the armored trains look in the concept art compared to the end game, where in this concept art, this looks a lot more like an actual realism-based militaristic armored train, with the train's cars it's carrying and all. As in the final game, they made the design a tad more cartoony with the giant eyes and wider appearance of the train car, also with the horns and fire being added on each car. I also want to point out how the concept art design has full-on train tracks leading the train where it needs to be, with these weird looking support structures that remind me a lot of cactuses, while in the final game the train runs along the same singular rails that Sonic and the gang grind on. The train tracks were probably removed to accommodate the gameplay of the grinding mechanic, but I I thought it was interesting nonetheless. As for Bullet Station, we're treated with another fully colored piece. Not only do we have a lot of the same architecture from the final game, with the giant cannons and stuff, but just look how cool that train looks! This thing's got a radically different design, not only from the previous concept piece, but also from in-game. I love how the train has a giant revolver as a cannon behind it, with the more industrial, almost Mad Maxi look this gives off, but fits so well in the Sonic universe with those exaggerated proportions the franchise is known for. God, I wish they kept this in the game. Frog Forest is one of my favorite and the most beautiful levels in the game in my opinion. And the concept art does not fail at all to showcase that, starting with another gorgeous colored piece of concept art with- Wait, is that a freaking Brachiosaurus? What? It seems they originally wanted Frog Forest and Lost Jungle to be prehistoric themed zones, with the inclusion of dinosaurs, which would have been so cool. I guess this is why we got those obscenely large frogs to replace the originally planned dinosaurs. I do wonder if this scrapped idea of a dinosaur themed level was repurposed a few years later for Dino Jungle and Sonic and the Secret Rings. Nonetheless, this is such an interesting shot. We also got this other cool shot that was shared by the Sonic Twitter, displaying the long, expanding grindable vines that are showcased throughout the level. Although it is interesting how the scenery and giant vegetations of the mushrooms and such give off that prehistoric feel, much like the previous piece. And while the blue mushrooms are still in the game, they are mainly regulated as background scenery and not as upfront as the concept art shows. Lost Jungle, on the other hand, has quite a few, starting with the forever anxiety-inducing alligator at the end of the stage, which looks incredibly creepy and a lot more detailed here. I really like the designs of Sonic Tails and Knuckles here also, as Sonic is just like, oh, cool, an alligator. Knuckles just looks pissed off as always, and Tails seems incredibly happy yet worried he could be close to instant death. It's a super cool piece of art. We also have this other piece that could fit in either Lost Jungle or Frog Forest, as a mechanic in the zone was going to be you could use the leaves as bounce pads, as this piece details with Sonic bouncing above one of the leaves. I assume this ended up getting swapped with the mushrooms that are all over the stages as bounce pads instead, but it's kinda cool nonetheless. As for our final piece, we have another colored concept art picture, which looks incredibly similar to the final area where the goal ring is after escaping the alligator. It seems instead they were going to originally just have it be a grinding section, but Sonic Team of course was like, nah, let's throw a giant ass alligator into the mix just for the lols. While Mystic Mansion didn't get any concept art released, we got this really awesome colored piece for Hang Castle, showing off the upside down sections of the level. The little details like the moon being upside down was super awesome too. I love this concept art piece so much with the gorgeous color palette it uses and the spooky vibe it gives off with the skulls embossed into the walls, the faces the buildings make, and the whole getup. I also found it pretty cool that there was a black cat in the background here too. Eggfleet and Final Fortress both got a really sick piece of art for each level, starting with Eggfleet, which looks drastically different in this concept art, 
As the scenery and atmosphere of Final Fortress is in this stage, I also found it super interesting how different the cannons looked in this as they're a lot more cylindrical compared to the in-game counterparts. I love the vibe this gives off and how ominous this looks with the thunder in the sky, smoke covering the gaps in between the ships, and that F-16 looking fighter jet in the sky. It's super cool. The stretch to the final section looks a lot more foreboding in this compared to the final game. And of course, Sonic Knuckles and Tails looking cool as ever. Final Fortress on the other hand, man, wow. It seems Sonic Team's original plan for Final Fortress was for it to be underwater with the giant fish and stuff looking at the base. I mean, how cool would that have been? I think this would have easily topped the final version of Final Fortress, which in my eyes isn't all that special compared to the arc. But man, this would have easily competed with it in my opinion. This is such an interesting piece to look at, and I would have loved to infiltrate this base in game, as it looked like Team Sonic is doing in the picture here. I wonder if this underwater base was another repurposed idea that turned into Sonic 06's aquatic base. Sonic Heroes, funnily enough, had scrapped zones that we got some sick concept art for once again, thanks to the Sonic Twitter. This first piece being what looks like a pirate zone with the giant ship and skull in the background. And what I found super interesting in this is Sonic is running on a giant freaking spine of some sort. I do wonder how much they would have had to cartoonify the remains of dead animals to fit in with Sonic Heroes' tone. This piece does remind me a lot of Pirate Storm and Sonic and the Secret Rings, so yet again, I do wonder if this was repurposed for a later game. And finally for this section, we also have another scrapped level concept with these sick looking ruins, which seems to be heavily inspired by the Japanese earthenware items and metalwork like Dogu, Haniwa, and Dotaku, which all were different kinds of statues, figures, and in the Dotaku's case, bells that were used in the late BC to AD periods of Japan's history. I would have loved to see what this zone would have been like in the final game. Also, it was super cool for Sonic Team to bring in and blend their home country's history and culture into a zone like this. It's a shame this was never added to the final game, but I do understand why, as this and the pirate level probably would have clashed big time with the game's tone. This Japanese-inspired zone reminds me so much of the Cemetery of Ash, aka the starting zone of Dark Souls 3. As we were talking about before, Sonic Team used renderware to make the game, and with that came new renders for most of the characters. And while most of the prototype 3D renders don't look notably different than their final renders, there are a few things I did want to point out that had some significant changes from the prototype to the final product. Starting with Rouge, who had a complete color palette swap in the prototype, which she's rocking a black suit with red accents, compared to her final product, Purple Suit with Pink Accents. I actually like this black suit a lot better, personally, as it looks a lot more spy-y, agent-ish, compared to the final suit. Big also had a substantial change, that being in the prototype, he has a much lighter shade of purple fur, compared to his more darker fur in the final product. And per usual, as we wrap up, I always have some super interesting bits that can only fit into the miscellaneous category of concept art and development images that I found cool, like this E3 version of the title screen, which can be restored in Dolphin that has all four teams in different colored panels, and Team Sonic up front compared to the final startup screen, which has Team Sonic jumping in the air. Another really cool thing I found were these incredibly early models slash renders of an unused enemy. These pictures display the body and spiky projectiles of a Unidus, which if you didn't know, is the black spiky ball guys that appear throughout SA1 and 2. And finally, one last yet very interesting thing I do want to point out is how in Sonic Heroes, in the intro sequence where Sonic is running through the grassy valley in the beginning, well in the first trailer and early videos, this place actually had a different texture, that of a checkerboard Green Hill pattern. Which makes me wonder if they were going to incorporate Green Hill into the game in some aspect, even if it was just a little reference like this. Kind of makes you wonder, you know? Well guys, that's going to be it for the concept art and development of Sonic Heroes. I was honestly shocked at how frequently requested this was for a video, as although I do love Heroes, I generally don't hear many people talk about it as much as the traditional adventure games or the 2D games. I have a lot of nostalgia for this game personally, as it was the Sonic game I remember playing the most when I was younger. So much so, I even had the Sonic Heroes sticker wrap up you could cover your GameCube in back in the day. Anyways, thanks so much for watching and I hope I was able to give you guys some new information or trivia to take home. I hope you guys enjoyed the video and if you did, make sure to like and subscribe and as always, I will see you guys in the next video. Take care.